But we're back in the Sermon on the Mount, and we have come to the conclusion. And uh, if you've been following this series all along, you might think, well, deja vu, we already talked about these passages. Because the very first time when I introduced the Sermon on the Mount, I, I came and gave uh, some instruction, some, some preaching on uh, the, the conclusion to kind of say this is where the whole sermon goes. And now we've gotten there the long way. So we're going to zero in on a couple of these passages. Um, we, we're going to do two little sections today, two little sections next week, and then we're going to do a sermon that's kind of like uh, just reflection on, on what I learned preaching the Sermon on the Mount. Um, so we, we've come through the content. We had the golden rule in chapter 7, verse 12. So whatever you wish that others would do to you, do also to them, for this is the law and the prophets. And that concludes the middle section and sort of ties in with chapter 5, talking about the law and the prophets. And then Jesus, to, to end the sermon, gives some warnings. Okay, He's been preaching some pretty tough stuff. And uh, he, he, he knows that it's tough. He knows it's not easy. He knows there are challenges to following this kingdom kind of life. Um, and so he ends giving a number of pairs, okay, a number of dualisms, okay, it's pairs of sets of two, okay. And uh, so there are two ways and two kinds of fruit, and then there's going to be two destinations and two foundations. So there, there's this, uh, this contrast theme. Uh, so let me read our verse for today, chapter 7, starting in verse 13, going through verse 20, and you'll, you'll hear the contrast. Enter by the narrow gate, for the gate is wide and the way is easy that leads to destruction, and those who enter by it are many. For the gate is narrow and the way is hard that leads to life, and those who find it are few. Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. You will recognize them by their fruits. Are grapes gathered from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? So every healthy tree bears good fruit, but the diseased tree bears bad fruit. A healthy tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a diseased tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Thus you will recognize them by their fruits. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So Jesus is setting up several parallels. The, the first, it involves these two different uh, directions, a, a gate and a, and a path or a way. Um, these, we you have to sort of think through in the first century. Um, a lot of the communities around where Jesus is preaching on the Sea of Galilee uh, are fishing communities, but but some of the older cities that are near there, uh, Megiddo, Beit Sheon, there's a number of these towns that are old fortified cities. And, and what they would do is they would, the, the people would sort of build up a mound of, of earth and build a city and then wall, put a wall for that city. Okay. And so the only way into the city was through the gates. And that was always tricky with gates in these old cities. Okay. Because you, you sometimes wanted wide gates. You wanted people to come in. You might want chariots to come in. In a, a, a city like Megiddo was probably a chariot city where uh, uh, the, the king's chariots would, would be stationed there. The problem, though, is if you have a big gate that's welcoming, it also will welcome in the enemy. So you want a narrow gate. But if you have too narrow a gate, then, um, then people can't get in and out. People lose access. Um, so gate size is really important. Gates uh, were often uh, accompanied by sections for troops to hide in and to, to be able to defend the gate. And then through the gate, it often opened on to uh, what would be like the marketplace, the, the central. It was like kind of downtown in these, in these places. And a lot of the business for the community happened in the gates because that's how everybody had to come. So uh, business could be done there. Um, the, the local judge or king or whoever might sit on a bima or a judgment seat there right near the gate uh, to pronounce judgment, or there may be business deals, covenants that would be cut there. Um, so gates are this important in and out, but, but the size of the gate is important. Uh, n none more significant than Jerusalem. Now, now, if you go to Jerusalem today, you'll see all these walls 
and there are all these gates that you have to come into the city by. Uh, all those gates and walls are from uh, the Crusades. Okay, Jerusalem has been destroyed and rebuilt a number of times. Um, but, but it was the same in Jesus' day. Uh, not the same layout, not the same walls, not the same gates, but the idea was the same. And so even if you had lived in uh, Capernaum or, or one of these little fishing towns, you probably had been to Jerusalem, and you probably understood this idea of the gate. Now, uh, a path was different. Um, in, in the Roman times, the, the Romans did build roads. They wanted to be able to get their armies. They wanted to be able to get chariots. And so they would take certain paths, and they would um, put stone down on them so they could get across. Um, but, but most of the roads were, were paths. Okay, were just walking trails. And where Jesus is probably doing the Sermon on the Mount is right near Capernaum and right near a major trade route called the Via Maris, uh, that uh, that helps connect Asia with uh, going up into Europe and Turkey and then all the way down into Africa. And uh, many uh, amazing wars and battles were fought to control that area. In fact, the earliest known war that we have in historical record happened uh, to, uh, to defend uh, that road. Um, the big deal was knowing which path you were going on. And um, the problem with a smaller path is it's easy to lose your way. Um, certain times of year, like uh, in the winter time, in, in the rainy season, uh, around the Sea of Galilee, it gets real green. And so a path would stand out more. Um, in the summer, probably you really needed to know where the path was because it may not be as clear to you. But you needed to know where the path was because in, in Israel, there, there are some mountains and some valleys where it's really not always easy to get where you want to go. you got to know how to, to get up on the ridges and follow the path to get to where you want to be. So Jesus uses this common imagery uh, to talk about um, how what he's trying to get people to do is not easy. Okay, the Following this king, I mean, think about all this stuff he said about not judging about laying up treasure, about not being anxious, about giving to the needy and loving your enemy, about dealing with anger and lust and divorce and oaths. I mean, who can live this? These are ridiculously high expectations. And the reality is most won't, and none of us truly can live them all the time. And so he says, the way that I'm talking about this kingdom stuff, yeah, it's a narrow gate. Not many people go through. It's a winding, hard path, and uh, not many people are, are able to find it and follow it. But always be careful as a Christian when you go with the crowd. In the Bible, crowds are always wrong. Okay? Crowds are always wrong. Okay? Christianity is more of a minority religion. Okay? It's, it's the small. If you sound and look like everybody else, you can almost be assured that you're not following the way of Jesus, because it, it's it's hard, okay. And 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 I don't know why Christians think their life ought to be easy. Anywhere you read in the Bible, you're going to find Jesus talking about trials and tribulations and difficulties. Blessed are the poor in spirit and the meek. I mean, following a Christian doesn't make life easy, okay. The, that's not the expectation. The expectation is very clear. Following Jesus is hard. It's not easy. Not everybody cuts it. Those who find it are few. So, uh, what? It, where do you go from there? Then you, you're, you're. How do you know where to go? Well, you, sometimes you got to follow leadership, right? Somebody's got to show you the way. But Jesus says, "Be careful, because not everybody who wants to show you the way knows the way, and okay? not everybody who wants to show you the gate." knows which gate they're going to. Beware of false prophets, but how do you know? So there's this great principle, very biblical principle, that Jesus uh, uses here. You'll know them by your fruit, by their fruit. Your life produces fruit. Okay, You, you do things, you act a certain way, you relate to other people, and what is the fruit? If I really want to know, I, and I mention this at funerals often, how do we know how somebody lived, or did they know Jesus? You know them by the fruits. What are the fruits that they produced? 
And, and Jesus has a couple different elements of this metaphor. It, and, and we don't have to think necessarily back to the first century to, to understand like we did gates and paths because th this is just everyday stuff. And I, as I've been reading this passage this week, I've been thinking about my own garden. We, my wife and I, we have a lot of different animals. We have four kids, a rabbit, a dog, some reptiles. I mean, we have frogs. We have all kinds of stuff. But we are just not good at plants, okay? If it has a heartbeat, it does great at the Rimmer's household. Uh, if, it, if, it, if it requires watering and soil, it it's not doesn't do as well for us. But, but we're trying it this year. We got some grow boxes you put water in. And, um, and so we're, we're figuring some stuff out. Some stuff's working. Some stuff's not. But, but the first element is the, the stuff that I planted, that, that's what ought to be growing, right? We have, we have grape tomatoes out there, okay, the little cherry tomato kind of things. Um, uh, so these little red tomatoes. Well, if I start getting bananas on that plant, then there's a problem, right? I may have bought the wrong plant or it was mislabeled, but the reality is whatever the plant is, that's the fruit it's going to produce, Okay, if you wait long enough, you can identify the plant based on the fruit. Okay, so the, the tomato plant is a tomato plant, and it better not be growing bananas or else we've got a problem, right? So you, you look at the fruit, okay, now, but, but sometimes the fruit is not good fruit, okay? So, so is it, it's, it's what kind of fruit, that's number one, number one part of the metaphor. Number two is good fruit or bad fruit. So uh, we have cucumbers out there uh, on my deck. And uh, we think the deck is too hot for the plants um, because the cucumbers are growing, but they're not growing real well. Um, they, they get like real fat on one end and real skinny on the other. Or we have had a couple that were real fat and then got real thin and then got real fat again. Uh, we, call them, we call them numchuck uh, cucumbers. They look like numchucks, you know. Um, it, it's not growing right. It's not growing right. Okay, we think maybe it's the heat of the deck. But, but you know... Um, they, they taste okay, but they're not growing right. Something's wrong with the plant. Okay, so, so part one, the right fruit goes with the right plant. Part two, the good plant produces good fruit. Our tomatoes are doing fantastic. Uh, our cucumbers, not so much. <laughs> okay, there's something wrong with those plants. Um, and I got to try to figure that out, figure out how to grow them differently next year, right? Um, and then part three is uh, every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down. Okay, you prune. Okay, and, and if anything that's not doing well, um, there's no use in keeping. Okay, we we have a zucchini plant. The zucchini plant hasn't produced at all. There's no point in the zucchini plant. We haven't really watered it that much anymore. We're just kind of letting it go because there's no use trying to save a zucchini plant that's not going to produce at all. Okay. Pruning, you got to chop. Um, Jesus uses this metaphor with a grapevine. Uh, I am the vine, you are the branches. At part of my house, we have a uh, pergola uh, outside the door. We have grapes over that pergola, and the grapes grow for a little while, but then before they get ripe, they start to get small and black and then fade because we never pruned them. We just have them there for the shade. Uh, but uh, and so they, they choke each other out. You have to prune, you have to cut away. Jesus is saying those ones who are not producing fruit or are producing bad fruit are going to get cut away. Okay, th this is a harsh reality, a harsh reality that if you really want to know what path you're on or you really want to know what the leader, what somebody is influencing you, what path they're taking you on, what gate they're heading you towards, take a look at the fruit. Take a look at the fruit of their lives. What are they producing because if you're living this kind of kingdom lifestyle, okay, if you're going on the hard path, going towards the right gate, you're living this stuff out, it ought to bear good fruit. I mean, uh, Paul even talks about the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, goodness, faithfulness. I mean, uh, Paul understands that good, life, good living, Christ at work in your life, ought to produce fruit. So if there's not fruit in your life, or if it's bad fruit, you need to take a look in the mirror. Or if somebody is, is trying to lead you and influence you, it, they're sort of being prophetic in your life, and you're not sure if you can follow them, the, the question is fruit. What are they producing? 
What are they producing in their family? What are they producing at work? What are they producing in all okay? Is it godly fruit? Then it's a godly plant. Then it's rooted in the right place. Okay? Then it's heading towards the right path. It's going to the right gate. Listen, Christianity is not easy. It's not easy. It's hard. It's hard to live this kind of life. But if you do, and Christ is working in you, it produces fruit, and you can know someone, and you should be able to look at your own life and see the fruit. And, and if there's no fruit, something's wrong. Either it's the wrong plant, or there's something unhealthy that needs to be corrected. Beware of false prophets. Pay attention to who you're following. Pay attention to where you're going. Pay attention to your own fruit. All these warnings that Jesus knows, we need to hear after hearing all this Sermon on the Mount.